Our children have been watching a series called Torchlighters. Anybody know what Torchlighters is? All right, it's a it's a really neat um, multi-series on uh, little biographies on Christian faithful men and women through the ages who finished the race well. Uh, Mark talked about the endurance. Um, Anywhere from the early centuries to John Newton to Perpetua to a number of people, George Mueller. And so they're about 30-minute episodes, um, and it's an animation. So it's pretty neat to watch our kids sit there and, and watch stories that are pretty deep about following Jesus. Um, you tear up, you're watching that as an adult. And so one that they've watched on numerous occasions, they'll say, Dad, we want to watch the one on World War II. And what they mean is they want to watch the one on Cory Tan Boo, the Dutch Christian who was thrown into the concentration camp with her sister for protecting Jews from the Nazis in World War II. And in that, one of the key characters that shaped Cory, Cory is the one that is often known for her books and her ministry because she lived another 40 years afterwards. And, uh, and, and died, I believe, at 90 or something like that. But one of the characters that really shaped her was her sister, Betsy. Betsy was a strong Christian before Corey became one. Betsy is the one who suffered deeply in the concentration camp and died there. Her body left the camp as one who died. You know, she would read and memorize scripture while she and Corey, her sister, would lay on a bunk bed infected with bed bugs and the room filled and stuffed with scores of sick people and hungry people and cold people. She would encourage her sister, Corey. She would say, Corey, you need to thank God even for the dirty and infected bed that we lay on. In all things, give thanks to God. And, and her sister would have a hard time. And she would say, we need to pray for those Nazi soldiers that they would know Jesus. And God would save them. And Corey would struggle with that. Before Betsy died, she told her sister, and I quote, There is no pit so deep that God is, still not, de is not deeper still. They felt like they were in a deep pit. He says, God is deeper still. God is with us. And there, 12 days later, after her sister um, Betsy died, Corey was miraculously released. And a week later, the women of her age group were all killed in the gas chamber. Betsy suffered until she died, but her faith in the Savior showed that it was all worth it because of the incomparable glory that awaited her as she slipped into eternity. She actually saw her present suffering as a mark of her discipleship and the adoption of God's child. And so she longed for future glory, and she knew that outweighs any possible suffering in this present life. If you've never uh, have read or watched, I think you'll be really helped as a Christ follower to really see their lives being lived out. How does one suffer and still keep joyful perspective like Betsy Tamboom and later her sister, Cory Tamboom? We met her own prison guards later on. Well, I believe today's passage will help us see and shape our own perspective on how Christ followers are called to endure suffering with Christ, even as we await to enter glory with Christ. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. We will read from verse 12 to 18 together, but we will focus on 17 and 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Let us pray. Father, we ask now that you would open our minds and our hearts. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would guide and direct and help us receive your word and respond in humility. Strengthen us. Be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 8 gives us glorious realities of what it means to follow Jesus. No condemnation, no bondage, which is evidenced by the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in each believer. We see that in these first 11 verses. Last Sunday, Pastor Venice took us from verse 12 to 17, where we considered another great privilege. What is that? Adoption as God's children, no more slavery to sin, where we have been call, given the privilege to call God Abba Father. That is wonderful sonship, that we're sons and daughters of God. So Paul keeps on unpacking these glorious realities that are so deep that Christ's followers are almost overwhelmed. Today, as we look at 17 and 18, we will see another consequence, another reality of being the children of God. We're children adopted. We call God Abba Father, such nearness and closeness. God is not a loaf. He's not distant, but he's caring, engaged, and personal, living in and through us, through the Spirit. And as children of God, we are introduced to two themes at the end of verse 17 that occupy the rest of of Romans 8, and they're this, suffering and glory for the rest of the chapter. The first 16 verses gives us all these beautiful realities. And Paul now says, hey, this power, this glorious gift, it actually is preparing you for suffering in the life now and the glory in the life to come. So here's the main point of 17 and 18. Believers must see the present suffering in light of future glory. Believers must see the present suffering in light of future glory. Paul has actually already touched on suffering in chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. In fact, when we were going through that text, we were still in the banquet hall. I still remember talking about it because on the theme of suffering, I talked about uh, William Wilberforce. And a number of young adults wanted to know more about him. And we, we got together at a place and we watched the movie, which doesn't do justice to his life, actually, but it gives us a taste of it. Paul talks about it in Romans 5, 3, and 4. It is not pleasant, and yet God uses it to produce a step-by-step -step transformation that is intended to make me and you, who are Christ's followers, look more like his son. That's the intent there. So we can see this being drawn out in at least two ways in verse 17 and 18. So I just have two points to share for us to consider this morning. First one being this, to be the children of God is to suffer with Christ. It's very plain in verse 17, the latter part of it. To be the children of God is to suffer with Christ. All this time, again in Romans 8, we've been in the deep treasure box of what it means and what it ought to look like to walk in the Holy Spirit. As we have experienced a wretched struggle with indwelling sin in chapter 7, we are to know that the Holy Spirit within us guarantees that one day we will inherit the world with Christ in our resurrection body, where sin will be no more. So far from despairing, this is meant to give us confidence to press on with the battle against sin day by day. Have you ever done anything temporary where it looks like the project will never finish? Like this summer, um, I set aside a week 
to work with my friend to build a retaining wall in our backyard. That retaining wall was about 45 feet long. When we first started digging the ground, I sat there for a moment and said, this will never get done. I just wanted to, part of me wanted to quit. It was the hottest week of the summer. And I was drenched in sweat every single day. And in the flesh, I felt a little bit of despair. But you know what? We worked on it. We worked on it. And praise be to God, it got finished. It looks great now. But even in the temporary, you and I experience despair. You ever start a house project and you're like, this is such a waste of time. Why am I doing this? I've done that too. I think Mark shared an example with me too, that they had a leak. We had a leak last year and it took me forever to fix it. So in the temporary, we feel a little bit of despair. I could be meeting with someone. I could be reading. I could be encouraging someone. Why am I painting the walls? It's necessary in the temporary. And so we feel the despair spiritually much more. God says, hey, he's strengthening us to fight the battle against sin day by day. Look with me to verse 17. Okay, it says, And if children, it's building up from 16 onwards, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Okay, just in case, Paul is saying, in case you think this is a walk in the park, you're looking at all those glorious realities in the first so many verses. Let me tell you something. Let me remind you. Let me put something before you here, he says. There is a sting in the tail end of verse 17. This verse actually functions as a transition verse in which Paul is about to give an extended treatment on the subject of suffering and the Spirit. To be heirs with Christ means to be united with him and inherit all the promises that are in Jesus, but also means that the shape of his life must be the shape of our life. The shape of Jesus' life will be the shape of our life. And sometimes when you think about what he went through in this world, you realize that it's not a walk in the park. All the inheritance that is promised to his redeemed children will one day be given to us in glory. But here we are. You know, when we began our first song, Roshan talked about how do we then live and be encouraged between now and glory. And so Paul is about to talk about that. We must follow him on the road that he himself walked on the way to glory, the road of suffering. So the pathway of future glory for us as it was for the Lord Jesus, must be through present suffering. That's what the word in verse 17, Paul says. As long as suffering is brought up in Scripture, we must be mindful of a universal reality for everybody. This is not just for Christians, but for anybody. And that's this. Reality number one, we should expect suffering living in a broken world. We should expect suffering living in a broken world. The witness of the apostles and the rest of Scripture does not say, if you suffer. Suffering is assumed because we live in a fallen, broken, corrupt world by sin. Paul assumes, and correctly, so that reality of suffering for all people in a fallen world. So there's a universal reality of suffering at some level for everyone. This includes things like illness. This includes grief, hunger, financial loss, injustice, natural disasters. We suffer and grieve when family is falling apart, when a child disappoints us, when a spouse fails to be faithful. We suffer under trauma of a dark time in life. We suffer under long seasons of sickness. The list is endless. And at last, we suffer when there is death. This is the reality in which we live. And so God through the Holy Spirit, leads Paul to give a pastoral concern for the Christians in Rome and by implication for all of us through the ages. Since the secular world around us has sought to reject the reality of God and render him not relevant, we don't need God. We live in a world suffering, but we begin to live in what we described as humanism. 
where a man becomes the central hope. In this state, people still suffer. But it's sad because people suffer in a form of emptiness. And eventually, it leads us to despair. Because when we suffer, where do we find hope and comfort? Everything that we try to fill leaves us empty. We see emptiness in art. Some people try to say, you know what, this will fill me. We see emptiness in music. Modern day poets and philosophers who influence millions of people around the world and bringing millions of dollars into their pockets. They influence young minds and hearts with their music and lyrics and rhyme, but leaves us empty and wanting something more, something that is lasting. We also see suffering in staggering amount of youth who have been exposed to drugs and who eventually some are led to suicide. I shared an article with our elders this past week about the growing, growing concern of how many young people are ascribing to death with dignity. It's called MAID or assisted suicide that's legal in our country. I read that and I felt sick. It is despairing that people are suffering and they feel my only way now is death. And it's been legalized and it's, the bar is being lowered by the year of how young you could be to make that decision now. Christ's followers are not insulated from emptiness or from depression or even despair. I know Christians who have profoundly suffered for many years. If you are familiar with Pilgrim's Progress, read it to your children, read it for yourself. The author, John Bunyan, suffered many years in prison for proclaiming the gospel. None of us are exempt from this kind of suffering, but apart from the gospel, it will be impossible to make sense of why suffering exists and why it does not have to be the last word. Apart from the gospel of grace, we will always respond to suffering in the wrong way. That is guaranteed. James Montgomery Boyce gives several examples of how people tend to respond to suffering apart from the gospel. When the gospel, when Jesus is not our sole source of hope. Let me give you three examples. Some respond in anger. They blame, even curse God for their misfortunes. And sadly, this also has been true of some who profess to be Christ followers. I'm mad at God. And often it's because God has an answer to prayer. They blame God because he has not done something for them that they wanted, whether it's school, whether it's a spouse, whether it's finances, Forgetting that Jesus never promised us an easy life here, much less a fulfillment of our desires. He has called us to discipleship and glory is thereafter. Some may not be anger, but some respond in avoidance. If the path before them looks hard or even undesirable, some people turn from it and try to find something easier and more rewarding. Or if the path cannot be avoided, they try to balance it with other things that are more attractive. Sometimes people ask God to remove a suffering, such as sickness, especially when it is terminal and difficult. And we should keep praying for healing, even as we acknowledge that God may do otherwise. For example, in your family and in your life, when there are people who are suffering, Christian, we should pray for them and with them. I pray regularly for my wife's hip and back issues. I pray for my son's asthma. Um, I prayed next to my mentor who was dying, fighting cancer for a third time for his healing. And each time, God responded differently. I pray almost daily for my migraines that makes me feel useless and incapable of being useful sometimes. But the healing in itself is not the ultimate goal. God's glory is. And that's what I need to remember. That somehow, in some way, God will get the glory. Another common response, uh, there, is, uh, there is anger, there's avoidance. Another common response is apathy. It is an attempt to be detached from the problem. Anybody ever tell you you're stoic? You know, somebody's suffering and you're like, so what? Apathy is that that this stoic reality we tend to carry 
and we just are indifferent to the suffering of others. This may help ignore the subject, but it's void of joy. It has nothing to do with the gospel of grace. So brothers and sisters, we cannot be stoic. We must relate to other people's suffering, pray with them and for them. Now, if you're not a Christ follower, friend, you have to consider what is your attitude towards suffering in this life? Is it anger? Is it avoidance? Is it apathy and indifference? Or is it something else? This book, the Romans, it tells us that we don't naturally want God. Instead, we just want the things that God has made so that with ease, we trade away the glory of God for things, other things, temporary things. We trade away true and lasting joy for suffering actually and for emptiness on our own. Apart from Christ, everyone, one way or another holds an attitude that the glory of God is unworthy of our time and value and thanksgiving. It's not worthy of my time, I think. Yet, this is the most foolish and self-destructive thing that anyone can ever do in this life. Say, I don't want, and I do my own thing. Friend, here is why coming, the coming of Christ, the death of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ is the most important reality that anyone can ever consider. Because God is holy, and he has to judge sin for sinners. And apart from Christ, he can cast us to hell. But God is also loving and gracious, and he does not avoid sinners. God does not live in avoidance like we do. He meets us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And because God in Jesus bore our sin on the cross, he's not indifferent to us. God is not stoic to leave us to suffer without hope. Because of God's amazing grace, the very glory we trampled on and traded away, God gives us in Jesus. See how beautiful the gospel is? I do everything possible to mess up, to get locked up and waste my life, and God in his mercy saves you? This is the gospel of grace. And it is to Christ you must look, friend, the one who humbled himself on the cross, who bore our sin in his death, who defeated his curse in his resurrection, and now gives new life and power through the Holy Spirit. This has been the plan from eternity past. Let today be the day that you turn from your sin and put your faith and complete trust and confidence in Christ. If you do, then you'll be given the greatest privilege to be the sons and daughters of God. And then you're called to suffer with Christ and look and await the glory that comes. For Christ followers, there is an important implication that we can draw out of verse 17, and that's this. Suffering will always accompany a godly lifestyle. So there's the universal suffering that all people suffer because if you live in a broken world. And then there is a, for Christ followers and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, there's a suffering that will accompany for living a godly lifestyle. What is a godly lifestyle? Well, living in obedience to Jesus Christ and his commands. Coming under the scriptures as our highest authority. So it's important that we don't get this confused with suffering also due to our unwise decisions in life. So I make a bad decision. Oh, I'm suffering for you. Actually, no, you're, I'm suffering because I made an unwise decision. I, I, I was speeding on the 401. I got a ticket. That is not suffering. That is me being really unwise and getting a ticket. And so that's important to, to distinguish that, just not over-spiritualizing our bad decisions. But when we are living in obedience to Jesus, suffering will come our way. In fact, if you consider the first 16 verses of Romans 8, it becomes clear that the person of the Holy Spirit enables believers to experience their new life in their inner beings and we're led to live holy lives. Remember, the Holy Spirit makes us holy, living in us. So if we're living a holy life, a godly life, suffering will come our way. It will accompany us because believers are being renewed and no longer living according to the pattern of this world, Romans 12, 1 and 2. We're living, our minds are being renewed. Our, we are being changed. Our mindset is being changed. In, in if you see it between verses 5 and 8, it talks about walking in the mindset of the Spirit, 
or in the flesh. And so we're being changed here. The earliest of Christian followers suffered for the gospel as soon as they began to walk in obedience to the great commandment. As soon as they did. You just have to read Acts. Peter and John were jailed in Acts 4. Stephen was stoned and killed in Acts 7. In Acts 12, James was beheaded and it keeps going. And then we see Paul and his suffering. You see, Paul, the writer of this letter, was imprisoned multiple times, beaten, shipwrecked, starved, threatened, and left for dead. Countless believers have been ridiculed, hated, abused, and eventually killed for their faith. This they endured on top of the suffering of the common men that all of us go through in a fallen world. So now one may say, is this worth it then? Is this worth it? Is being a Christian so you're telling me there is the universal reality of suffering because we live in a fallen world. Following Jesus is going to bring more suffering to me? That sure doesn't sound like health, wealth, and prosperity to me. I don't want that. Is it worth it? Does future glory outweigh the present suffering? Is it worth following the cost? Paul has one answer. It's worth it. It's worth it, he says. He's about to give us his very clear answer to why in verse 18. And that is our second point. Our suffering are momentary in light of future glory. In the first point, we saw the present in end of verse 17. In 18, we move to the future. There are two important parts to verse 18. One speaks of the present and the other speaks of the future reality for all believers. First, it is the phrase, the suffering of this present time. This is an astonishing statement and even more astonishing because Paul applies it to his own life. What did this man endure? Well, he endured so much. Shipwrecked, sinking in the water, that it be being stoned to death, left to dead, whipped within an inch of his life. It's that very man who now says to the Christians in Rome, that the present suffering are not worthy. Now, you know, if this was somebody who lived in high places, in luxury, and is writing about suffering, the, 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 the recipients are like, what do you know about this? What, you have no clue what we go through. But he has endured, and the Spirit has strengthened him, and God has been with him, so he can write from his own life experience. This is why it's important for us even to read biographies, be it Corey Tan Boom or others, and learn from them or hear from Christians in other parts of the world. Paul is saying it's not worthy to be compared because we're tempted. I am tempted to consider whatever suffering it is and say, oh, this, I, 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 I prefer not to go through this. Paul's saying, listen, it's not worthy. He's saying, if you know where you're headed in the future, you won't even entertain the temporary pleasures the way you used to. They won't even have the same attraction to you the way they did before you came to Christ. That's the Christian living. The, the thing that Satan often does, very subtly, I find, is he tries to often put uh, the temporary pleasures before me to keep chasing that so that I take my eyes and forget the future glory that awaits all believers. So a lot of us are running around chasing in the wheelhouse the temporary pleasures. I have it today. Next day, I'm empty again. I got to do it again, again, and then again. And thus we forget what is laid for us in the future. Paul is saying, if you know, you won't even compare it. The Holy Spirit gives us new and godly desires that we can never conjure up on our own. We can't fake that. What possible purpose or gain can suffering have on the believer? Is it worth it? Paul is saying, absolutely, it's worth it. Here's an implication for us to consider. Is suffering worth it? Paul is saying this. Uh, an implication is that suffering is proof of our adoption by God. I, I don't think people want to hear this. Suffering is proof of our adoption from God. God is making us holy. We're living a pattern that is opposite to the world, the world becomes hostile to us. And it is proof, not because of my bad decision, but because of me living an obedient life to Jesus. For example, okay, in persecution, it proves that we are really God's children. 
And here's the thing. I know we live in the West. And I know when we talk about persecution, we sometimes have the idea of maybe there's some political stuff that happens. There's, there's things happening in our culture. I'm not saying we're totally void of it, but it's really helpful for us. I find especially that I actually read about what's going on in other parts of the world. We should do that regularly. Um, one ministry that I use is called Open Doors. It, it closely follows Christian persecution and works with churches in the most hostile places. I looked it up, and as of March of this year, here are the top five countries that persecute Christians openly. Number one is Afghanistan. After the withdrawal of the U.S. soldiers last August, it became the number one country of persecuting Christians. In fact, they told them, if you are a Christian, you're dead, unless you convert to Islam. Number two is North Korea. Number three is Somalia. Number four is Libya. Number five is Nigeria, where you have Boko Haram taking young girls into their camps, impregnating them, and some of them escape and go back to their village and they're not accepted anymore. And so it is horrific when you read these stories. A woman in India watches her sister being dragged off by Hindu nationalists in this remote place. She doesn't know if her sister is alive or dead. A man in North Korea prison camp is shaken awake after being beaten unconscious. The beating begins again. A woman in Nigeria runs for her life. She's escaped from Boko Haram, who kidnapped her. She's pregnant. She returns home. Her community will reject her and her baby. A group of children are laughing and talking as they come down from their church's sanctuary after eating together. Instantly, many of them are killed by a bomb blast. It's Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka. That could be my kids. That could be our children if we were living there. These people don't live in the same regions or even in the same continent, but they share an important characteristics. They're all Christians. They all suffer because of their faith. So while Christian persecution takes many forms, it is defined as anyone whose hostility experienced as a result of their identification and their commitment to Jesus. From Sudan to Afghanistan, from Nigeria to North Korea, from Colombia to India, followers of Christianity are targeted for their faith. They are attacked. They are discriminated against. At work, at school, they risk sexual violence, torture, arrest, and much more. In the last year, it's estimated that over 360 million Christians are living in places where they experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. Let me give you some numbers. It should be up on the board as well. 5,898 Christians have been killed for their faith. 5,110 churches and other Christian buildings have been attacked. 4,765 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. This is all from open doors. One church leader from a very hostile country put it this way. One can almost say that suffering for Christ is a mark of discipleship. So when I read this, it really challenges us who may be very insulated and maybe cry foul for the smallest things sometimes. Paul in his letter to the Corinthian to the Philip the church in Philippi reminded them of this in Philippians 1 29 and 30. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake. Verse 30, engage in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. The believers in Philippi saw Paul suffer in Acts 16, almost left for dead. He's writing them years later saying, hey, listen, you're not only called to believe and receive all of these great glorious blessings, but also to suffer with Christ. Engage in the same battle that I'm still engaged in that you hear about. He teaches that both suffering and faith are gifts of God. 
Paul says, they have been granted to you. Imagine that. Granted to us to suffer for the sake of Jesus is a privilege. This he uses himself as the, his own life. And they were privy to it. And he maintained his joy while experiencing deep opposition from those who were hostile to him. What other thing can suffering do? Well, it sanctifies us. Again, this is not popular. God uses this to make us holy. He is the refiner who knows when and how we will be ready and be usable for his work. The Lord will purify us until he can see the face of Jesus in us. And it's painful. Now, this takes us to our final key connecting point that helps Christian keep perspective despite the varying levels of suffering. And that's this. Our sufferings are momentary in light of future glory. The last part of verse 18 gives us this. For I consider that our suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The word glory in this verse refers to something that is heavy and weighty in substance. It's not some cheap, shallow word. And so if you uh, imagine a scale, and so in the scale you see future glory at the bottom, and then over there you see present suffering, the weightiness of God's glory is so heavy that no amount of suffering in this world can actually move that balance. Nothing can. In fact, Paul is saying the future glory laid up for us is so weighty that our present sufferings are like feathers compared to it. They can't even begin to move the scale. Again, in 2 Corinthians 4.17, Paul says this, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Same author. Romans, Acts, his life, First Philippians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians 4. This momentary light affection, affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Again, Paul is saying, if you know where you're headed in the future, and if you know what awaits you in glory, that you won't even view the present suffering with Christ and think it's a waste. Isaiah says, God will give us beauty for ashes. He's saying that no matter what believers go through in this life, it cannot be matched with the glory that awaits us. Notice Paul is not living in avoidance. He's not minimizing suffering, but he's contrasting it to future glory. There will be none of it. Um, I just finished going through a book with a number of our guys in our discipleship called Character Matters. And in one chapter, the author talks about Polycarp. He was a pastor in the second century. Killed around AD 155. Polycarp served the Lord during one of the most dangerous seasons of Christian history under the Roman Emperor. The Romans would kill Christians, especially pastors who would preach the gospel because it taught that was only one God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus the Emperor of Rome is to be prayed under their idea and respected. But Polycarp said, no, we pray to the Lord. We trust him, not as Rome demanded. So the governor warned him and said that he would be burned to death if he didn't recant his faith and burn incense to Caesar, the Roman emperor. Here's how Polycarp responded to him, and I quote, The fire you threaten me with cannot go on burning for very long. After a while it goes out. But what you are unaware of are the flames of future judgment and everlasting torment which are stored for the ungodly. That was his response. Polycarp knew his God and many who suffered before him. He knew that his king will receive him in glory and then waited and, 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 and what was awaiting for him is incomparable. And even in that moment, he was kind to tell his persecutors that unless they repent, that what they will receive is everlasting judgment. Look, here's the obvious application for here. That's this. We must endure suffering with future glory in sight. When we're suffering because we're trying to walk in obedience to Jesus, Satan may come and say, even challenge, even say, look, are you even real? God, does God even care for you? And we must say, glory awaits us. 
We must look back to the saints of the past, examples of the Bible, and say, no, they suffered worse than us. And they're with glory in Christ. Right now, as we're here, suffering is happening around the world. Read open doors, read different things, and know that these Christians are living the faith. And so can we, and so must we. It is necessary, as the Lord taught, that this was necessary for him to suffer. In John 15 and 16, he tells us that they, if they persecuted the Lord, they'll persecute us. The world, you will have tribulation, he says. Although suffering is necessary and has value, it is not the end of the story. Glorious. God wanted Christians in Rome who read this letter, the first audience, who are about to experience, you know what they were about to experience after this? The persecution of Nero. He's preparing them to keep their eyes set on future glory. God wants them to truly believe that when you look forward to the weighty and glorious future in Christ, then you and I can join the saints of the past, the present, and the future and say, it's worth it because of what awaits you and me. Brothers and sisters, when we become discouraged in the face of suffering, for it will come our way, let us ask them for the Lord's grace to daily walk with genuine consciousness of the coming and everlasting glory. With that in mind, let us read Romans 8 with fresh eyes so that the Holy Spirit may plant this reality deep in our hearts and in our minds. The main point, believers must see the present suffering in light of future glory. Let us pray. Lord, I talk and pretend not that I know the depths of suffering. But Lord, we thank you that in your word, you warn and prepare and encourage us. Thank you for your faithfulness in the lives of saints around the world, even today, this morning, right now, in the past centuries and decades. And until Jesus comes back, please equip us, your children, Lord, to suffer well. Strengthen us when we are weak. You are our help. We are hopeless without you. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would remind us often of future glory. Help us to live in light of that consciously, daily submitting to you. And be glorified, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.